Thank you. And that concludes topical questions. We're going to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 15243 in the name of Michael Matheson on ultra low emission vehicles. And I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion in his name. Thank you, President Officer. In 2017, we announced our commitment to phase out the need for petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2032. Since then, we have seen huge shifts in electric vehicle, developed electric vehicle market alongside new commitments to decarbonising transport, both from within the automotive industry and by the international community. By way of example, the number of EV models available is set to jump from 155 at the end of 2017 to 289 by 2022. Car manufacturers like Nissan and Volvo anticipate that 50% of all their sales will be of EV by 2025. And countries such as India, Denmark, Germany and the Netherlands and Ireland are proposing to ban sales of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. The UK Parliament's Business, Energy and Industry Committee recommended that the UK Government bring its ambition for ultra-low emission vehicles in line with Scotland's. Once again, we have shown that this administration's leadership on climate change and low carbon technology is giving Scotland the competitive and comparative advantages needed to respond to today's global challenges and opportunities. Our commitment was also an important step in creating certainty for business during a period of unprecedented uncertainty and change. The Scottish Government's climate change targets, our energy strategy targets, our commitment to remove the need for new diesel and petrol cars and vans by 2032 all provide companies with a clear direction of travel. They show that Scotland is committed to pioneering a low carbon future and as a result they mark Scotland out as a centre for low carbon investment. So what progress are we making on our 20 32 commitment. I'm pleased to say that we are fast approaching the installation of Charging Point 1000 on the Charging Places Scotland network. This is an important milestone, meaning that the average distance from any given location to the nearest public charging point is just 2.78 miles in Scotland, the lowest in Great Britain, where the average is 4.09 miles. This reflects our commitment to bringing robust, reliable electric vehicle charging to people and places across Scotland. We are providing more funding than ever before to expand the number of low emission vehicles on our roads through our switch on fleet and low carbon transport loan. The latest SMMT figures show that 4.6% of cars newly registered in Scotland so far in 2018 were low carbon. There has also been a 46% growth in registrations of ultra-low emission cars in Scotland over the past year. This is 13 percent percentage points higher than the rest of the UK. I'm happy Murdo to give Fraser. way to Murdo Fraser. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Uh, as the owner myself of a hybrid vehicle in everyday use, I applaud the direction of travel, uh, if I can use that pun, uh, from the Scottish Government. But I'm also the owner of a classic car, and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can give us a reassurance that the owners of classic and historic vehicles that require to run on petrol and diesel will still be able to use these after uh, 2030. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator Officer, there's no plan to ban uh, petrol or diesel vehicles. However, he may have some difficulty in getting into some of the low emission zones in our big cities in Scotland once they're introduced in his classic uh, car. President Officer, in the past uh, year, we have supported orders for over 380 uh, UL EVs across Scotland's local authorities and a further 120 in public sector fleets. We're also working closely with the emergency services to increase the number of UL EVs in their fleet uh, with plans to replace over 150 police, fire and ambulance vehicles with UL EVs within the next 12 months. These investments, along, along with further planned support, 
will more than double the number of ULEVs we have supported in the public fleet to date. I'm pleased to confirm that orders for the first fully electric vehicles in the government car service have been approved and will enter service later this year. While our support has undoubtedly facilitated these successes, these achievements are a result of ambitious and partnership at working between uh, local authorities, uh, Scotland's public sector and the Scottish business community. For example, Dundee has recently, was recently named as Europe's most visionary, visionary city at the World Electric Vehicle Association Conference in Japan. And I'm sure Parliament will want to join me in congratulating the City Council, businesses and residents for, of the city for their vision and determination to make this happen. I'm more than happy to give way to uh, John Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister very much for giving way. He's mentioned electricity quite a few times. Does he think there's a place for hydrogen in, the, in this mix? Cabinet Secretary. If the member bears with me, I will get to hydrogen uh, because I do believe it has an important element to uh, play. Then also, this year we will expand the scope and ambition of our work so that Scotland is at the forefront of growth in ULEV in the ULEV market and our business community and workforce benefit from the opportunities that this growth presents. Currently, transport accounts for some 37% of Scotland's emissions and in 2016, road transport was responsible for 68% of transport emissions. Uh, these figures frame the challenge which we face. Uh, the need for uh, focused action is clear as is Scotland's potential to become an innovation centre in low-carbon transport. Scotland has one of the most highly qualified working-age populations in Europe. We have more world-class universities per capita than almost any other country. It's my ambition to build on these qualities to support low-carbon transport. To do this, we must take a lead in key technologies of the future and do so in a way that benefits all of society. Scotland must be an investor and producer of the innovations that will shape the future, not just a consumer. In addition to Scotland's considerable expertise in areas such as battery technology, power engineering and manufacturing of buses and specialised vehicles, there is also enormous economic potential from the use of hydrogen as a low carbon fuel in transport. We can build on existing projects in place such as Aberdeen, Fife, Orkney and now in Dundee to develop products, services, skills and expertise in hydrogen transport to benefit our economy and provide value to the wider world. I'll give way to the member. Daniel Johnson. I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I just wonder if there is a risk in over-focusing uh, on uh, the, the types of locomotion, whether it's hydrogen or electric, uh, at, at the exclusion of automation. The combined impact of automation and electric vehicles could have a, a, a transformative impact on our transport, and does that need to be taken into consideration? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member may raises an important point. Yes, it does have to be taken into uh, consideration. However, the timeline for progress in some of these areas is different. And that's why we need to take action now to make sure we're putting the right infrastructure in place in order to enhance, enhance or, uh, to bas basically make the best use we can of these new and emerging technologies, while at the same time adapting to new technology as it progresses, particularly in the CAV market, which I've got no doubt in the years ahead will continue to develop at a very rapid rate. So and also, we must ensure that the increased demands on Scotland's electricity network are managed effectively and that networks are suitably equipped to support our mobility agenda. As we are, work, we are working closely with network operators and other partners to understand the impact of EV uptake and to identify how innovation and smarter management uh, of this can help to reduce the need for upgrades and the associated costs and disruption. This means uh, harnessing the opportunity that vehicles uh, to grid, smart charging and grid technology can make in reducing the need for investment in the networks. However, new investment including from the electricity network companies in Scotland, will be required to meet and to manage the additional demands arising from the expansion of home and workplace charging. Scotland is well placed to suitably meet increased demands for electricity. We have a global reputation for renewable energy and increasing 
uptake of EVs offers the opportunity to exploit more of our renewable energy resources. This is uh, why we see economic as well as environmental benefits in making Scotland an early adopter of electric and low emission vehicles. It is vital that we explore and understand how shifts in mobility will affect Scotland's workplace and skill base and take advantage of these shifts now. Work is already ongoing through the Energy Skills Partnership and supported by Transport Scotland is linking up with business and automotive industry to, tra to create training opportunities for their staff. We recognise that this rapid period of innovation and change also presents real world challenges. We will continue to work closely with our stakeholders to explore these and I'm certain that Scotland's collective ingenuity will enable us to create opportunities for them. So, also, alongside making progress on ultra low emission vehicles, we also uh, continue to take bold action across different modes of transport. We're helping bus operators invest in new green buses to reduce carbon emissions and improve the offer to passengers. And we are introducing an improved bus services operators grant, low carbon vehicle initiative from the 1st of April 2019. And we'll bring forward a new green bus fund with funding weighted towards the lowest emitting buses. Investment in our railways will continue to be a priority for this government and the popularity of rail is expected to increase even further. As we prepare for the next rail investment cycle, we have a specific focus on low or zero carbon hybrid electric battery trains and hydrogen fuel cell powered trains to complement the revolution in rail and the low carbon electric traction. Transport Scotland and a Scottish Enterprise have also been supporting the successful, the successive, uh, successive phases of High Seas Hydrogen Ferry Project. This groundbreaking project is aimed at delivering the world's first seagoing fer vehicle ferry powered by hydrogen produced using locally generated renewable electricity. Autonomous vehicles, sharing and platforms uh, based mobility services have the potential to revolutionise mobility partners, patterns with implications across both private and public transport. And the recent announcement of Scotland's first autonomous vehicle trial on the Forth Road Bridge demonstrates our commitment to understanding what these shifts will mean in practice. Then also the automotive industry and the energy sector are dealing with considerable change stemming from technological, environmental and consumer trends. We are responding positively to that change, working with partners to ensure that the transition to a low carbon economy is as smooth as possible and benefits the people of Scotland. I look forward to hearing the views of members across the chamber and to continue to make progress with this ambitious and exciting agenda. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call Jamie Green to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, there's no better way to kickstart the new year by having a discussion around an issue which will affect not just this generation, but future generations to come, uh, and that of uh, climate change. Now, these benches will be supporting uh, the government's motion today, because I think it would be churlish to suggest that there's been no progress made on uh, ultra-low emission vehicles in Scotland. And I think all parties in this chamber should absolutely unite in supporting uh, this and any government who moves towards uh, a reduced carbon transport network. Uh, but our amendment, whilst acknowledging those efforts, also recognises uh, that there's still a lot of work to be done, uh, specifically around uh, our remote rural and island communities, where there's still uh, uh, much uh, worry around uh, this move. I'll touch on that in more detail, but I would like to uh, summarise some of the key points up front about some of the obstacles I think that are facing uh, as in terms of opening up uh, this opportunity. There are issues that, that we cannot ignore uh, and we should listen to those concerns. The standardisation of charging points, the location and quantity of charging points. The Cabinet Secretary made uh, a lot of comments on, on, on the quantity, but uh, people still have uh, range anxiety uh, in terms of uh, acquisition of these new vehicles and where they think they can and will take them. And ultimately, uh, it comes down to consumer choice as well. Uh, the, uh, the, the range uh, of vehicles available to you that will meet your, the needs of you, your family, your business, and of course your personal 
uh, choice as well. Uh, th th these benches are fully committed uh, to our uh, climate obligations. Our own uh, recent environment and climate change paper set out a number of ideas and measures that we would uh, like to introduce to encourage the take up and uh, uh, growth of ownership of electric vehicles. Uh, I'm happy to share some of those with the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we have ideas around incentives, such as uh, free parking or use of specific uh, lanes, uh, the establishment of specific funds to help uh, rural communities, and the uh, further availability of charging points at train stations, especially around uh, railway uh, uh, car parks, and a mandatory consideration of electric vehicles and all future procurement plans, specifically procurement plans of public bodies where they will be purchasing large volumes of vehicles uh, for their use. Um, yes, I'm happy to. Julian Martin. It's maybe incumbent on us as um, society's highest earners, to earners and representatives to lead the way in our choice of vehicles and, and, and maybe go down the route of hybrid and electric first and show that we mean it. Jamie Green. Absolutely. And uh, the problem I have uh, with that, I can tell the member, is that uh, with the amount of miles and distance that we do, uh, as many others do in their day-to-day -day lives, there simply aren't any charging points uh, uh, near uh, where the places I need to be are. And if that is a worry to us, then it's a worry to people outside of this chamber as well. I think that's an important point. Uh, this, uh, I, I, I touched on it briefly, but range anxiety is an issue for people. Um, the idea that you could travel hundreds of miles and have time uh, to find the charging point uh, is putting people off changing their vehicles. Uh, I think there needs to be uh, a, a, an appropriate uh, number of charging points, but also some standardization on the technology that those charging points uh, provide. Um, what happens if you do run out of power in, an ag in a rural part of Scotland? Um, what happens if you find yourself in an area without uh, phone coverage to seek uh, for help? It's not just about making the points available and increasing the amount of points, and I welcome any increases, but as it currently stands, certain charging points are only available for certain types of vehicles, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, 1,000 charging points, well, there are 3 million cars in Scotland. There are more than 1,000 petrol stations. Uh, we could see a scenario where people are queuing. Uh, anecdotal evidence from, from other places that have done this, I've seen people queuing for up to four hours to get their car uh, into the charging point. Even if the charging speed is increasing and getting better as technology improves, uh, there's still uh, a severe lack uh, of spaces. So yes, we can set an example, and we should set examples, but the infrastructure uh, also needs to be there. Um, ultra low emission vehicles will help us achieve uh, our ambitions, but the reality is that electric vehicles currently account for less than 1% of Scotland's uh, nearly 3 million cars. And actually, uh, statistics just uh, recently released by Transport Scotland found that only 0.7% of people said that they currently owned a vehicle and only 40% said they would consider owning an electric vehicle. Now, that 40% is up, uh, but it's still not enough. And considering they might own one is not the same as going out and buy one. So if we're going to meet our 2032 targets at the current rate, uh, only 27% of new car sales will be electric by 2030. That's nowhere near uh, the target uh, that is currently in place. Uh, as I said, uh, it, it's about uh, creating that uh, culture and the infrastructure that is needed to make it easier for businesses, families, and commuters like us uh, to make that right choice. As the RAC Foundation said, you need to find the right charger at the right location with the right tariff scheme. And even then, it needs to be serviceable and not already in use by somebody else. Uh, there is welcome progress. Uh, the A9 electric highway is something I think uh, we should give credit to the government for. It is a good idea, but it is just one road. Uh, and I recall uh, when I uh, started uh, on my transport brief uh, asking some simple questions of the government about how much future-proofing had gone in to some of the recent infrastructure projects that uh, we've seen on the M8, the M73, M74 and the AWPR. And the very simple and short answer I got back from my parliamentary question was that these uh, motorways, whilst welcome, uh, weren't really future-proofed for uh, new ways and means of uh, driving, whether that's automation, or charging uh, electric cars. So I think uh, genuinely that future-proofing road infrastructure needs to lie at the heart of future projects. Uh, it perhaps is uh, too little too late in some parts already. Um, we will support uh, the government in its efforts to encourage more people to take up electric vehicles, but more pro progress is needed. We need steps taken 
to increase charging points, specifically in remote and rural areas. We need to tackle the range anxiety that I mentioned. We need to uh, incentivise adequately and appropriately uh, the take up of electric vehicles and there are a, a whole manner of ways we, we can do that. And also we need a change in procurement strategy so that the public sector is leading the way at the heart of its purchase decisions. Uh, we should also uh, provide adequate uh, transition support for buses and taxis and encourage car sharing. So we support this debate today uh, and we will support all of the amendments that have been proposed. They're very uh, uh, constructive and I'm looking forward to hearing some of the other uh, members speak today. But our support comes with a very timely warning that if current progress uh, is not matching the shared ambition that I think we all have and that needs to change. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, and I call Colin Smith to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Thank you, President Officer. Transport accounts for almost two-thirds of Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions, with road transport responsible for almost three-quarters of this. If we are to meet our targets to reduce emissions, we need to transform our transport system. And switching to ultra-low emission vehicles has a role to play in this transformation. But this issue isn't just about meeting environmental targets. Air pollution is a public health emergency. It's responsible for tens of thousands of early deaths each year across the UK. Poor air quality increases the risk of stroke and heart failure, and it causes and exasperates an ever-growing list of conditions such as type 2 diabetes, asthma, bronchitis, and atrial fibrillation. From low birth weight to dementia and old age, air pollution impacts on our health throughout our lives, but has a disproportionate effect on the health of children and of older adults. And it contributes to Scotland's shameful record on health inequalities with deprived urban communities often experiencing the highest rates of air pollution. So reducing air pollution is a public health necessity as well as an environmental one. And supporting the use of ultra low emission vehicles is an important part of this. But despite an increase in electric and hybrid cars in recent years, which is welcome, financial and practical barriers mean they still make up less than 1% of road vehicles in Scotland. The Scottish Government's overarching aim to increase the number and phase out the need for new petrol and diesel cars by 2032 is very welcome, but so far we've not had a comprehensive long-term plan from the Scottish Government incorporating all the incentives, the infrastructure, the technological developments that will be required to meet that aim. As a result, there does remain a significant barrier to overcome. Recent research by the AA found that just 31% of people want to own an electric vehicle and crucially, more than two quarters state that they are too expensive for them. We need to learn lessons from countries such as Norway, where ultra low emission vehicles now make up more than half of all new cars purchased, partly due to a range of measures and incentives which have almost wiped out the differences in costs between different vehicles. And we should ensure that incentives don't simply benefit those who can already afford a ULEV. More infrastructure investment is also required, not just in the number of public charging points whose growth has not kept up with the rise in the number of electric cars, but also in new and innovative technologies. Last year in Sweden, the world's first electrified road opened, which recharges the batteries of electric vehicles as they drive. Looking ahead, the, the tracked electric vehicle project proposes a new type of electrically powered highway for electric vehicles with autonomous driving capabilities. Across the world, exciting and transformative work is taking place and Scotland must be at the forefront of this. But it's not just about electric vehicles. As, as the Labour Amendment highlights and other speakers have mentioned today, we need to consider how we can better support hydrogen powered vehicles. Hydrogen based systems are at the heart of the development of greener ferries and my colleague Lewis MacDonald will highlight later how we've seen hydrogen powered buses rolled out in the northeast of Scotland. And just yesterday, Alstom and Evershaw Rail Group revealed plans to introduce hydrogen powered trains to the UK with the first expected to be on the tracks as early as 2022. This raises the fact that a holistic approach is needed to reduce emissions from transport that not only covers the use of ULEV cars, but delivers a model shift towards the use of public transport, in particular environmentally friendly public transport vehicles. It was once said, a developed country is not a place where the poor have cars, it's where the rich use public transport. But for far too many people across Scotland, public transport, particularly in many of our rural areas, is just not a feasible option. We can see this in the plummeting bus usage figures. The annual number of bus passenger journeys in a year is now 22% lower than it was when this government came to power. That's 107 million fewer journeys a year, yet bus fares have risen by 47% 
in the last decade. Increasing use of ULEV cars, desirable as that is, won't reverse that decline, or indeed it won't reduce congestion, but supporting more measures to promote, for example, bus priority would reduce congestion. And it's not just on our buses where we need to see public transport improvements. As I've already discussed today, performance in Scotland's rail network is less punctual and less reliable than it has been for more than a decade, yet fares have gone up by 35 per cent in the past 10 years. Rates of active travel, which is the ultimate form of healthy and environmentally friendly travel, also remain too low. The recent increase in spending on active travel is welcome, but it's important to ensure that the benefits of this investment are widely shared. Disadvantaged communities and rural areas cannot be left behind. Roger Geffen, the policy director of Cycling UK, also noted that UK cycling conditions still, and I quote, disproportionately deter young people, older people, women, and people with disabilities from cycling. We cannot expect car usage to reduce without delivering improvements to the alternatives. Presiding officer, in concluding, expanding the use of ULEF EVs in Scotland is a positive aim. I welcome the progress that has been made in recent years and Labour will be supporting the government's motion today, but we will also be supporting all the amendments that have been tabled given their focus on the need to build on this progress. Usage of ULEVs remains below where it has to be if we are to meet our ambition on this issue. The Scottish Government needs to provide a long-term plan setting out in detail the measures that will be taken to deliver its target that the need for new petrol and diesel cars will be obsolete by 2032. But beyond that, we must develop a more sustainable, integrated and affordable transport system in which public transport and active travel are realistic alternatives to the use of the car. President officer, I therefore move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call on John Finney to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I do uh, move that amendment in my name. And uh, I commend an <coughs> the government motion where it talks about uh, an unprecedented period. And it most certainly is an unprecedented period. I suspect we're talking about slightly different things, and it is the climate change that's the, uh, and the global challenge that presents for us that we need to, to consider, as well as the many commendable things that are mentioned here. Um, now, the, the climate bill as it stands in draft is, is insufficient as far as Scottish Green Party is concerned. We need a, a climate emergency bill. Um, a, the net zero emissions uh, by 2040 boost the 2030 targets and introduce a range of policies to make sure changes are not put off in the next decade, put off until then. Um, it also needs radical policies, and some of them have been alluded to by the previous speaker, Colin Smith. Um, it is about a, an attitude. So um, the transport policy sim seems fixated on road building. Another announcement yesterday, Scottish Government proudly trumpeting 40 million on another new road. And what happens is you build roads and people drive on them. We went, spent three quarters of a billion completing the M8, switch your radio on every morning, and there's congestion on the M8. So um, we need to take a different approach to things. And uh, a lot of what's been said seems presupposes more of the same, just a different mode of propulsion. Well, that's not going to work. Um, and it is true that the Scottish Government enjoy the, <coughs> excuse me, enjoy the support of all the opposition parties for the main uh, road building programme. As they know, they do not enjoy our support for that. We consider many of them indeed to be vanity projects and expenditure in my own area of up to 60 million, which in Transport Scotland's own figures, the trunk link road takes people between two points 12 seconds quicker is an obscenity and it's an obscenity we look to look at. So we also need to look at the whole system of inspecting, repairing and replacing because of course the Scottish Government with its commitment to all this massive funding of the uh, lung, uh, trunk road network, whilst the road network that is the responsibility of local authorities, uh, the fabric of that is decaying, and we heard a report yesterday about that. And that, <coughs> excuse me, that <coughs> excuse me, that's where the inspection and repair and replace come in. And uh, Scottish Green Party are not against expenditure on roads, but we would want to maintain our existing infrastructure before we consider anything else. Health has been alluded to by a number of the speakers and air quality is very, very important and uh, the significant thousands of people die every year as a result of air quality. And I, I want to name three locations in relation to this. I want to mention Academy Street in Inverness, uh, uh, the, the town I stay in, and the fact that the local authority there, quite the reverse of discouraging private motor vehicles into that area, were recently trying to encourage them in, in their 
uh, mistaken bid to increase shopping footfall in the town centre as they saw it. Scotland, there's a crying need for us to, to reduce the number of areas where air quality damages, particularly old, particularly in farming, particularly young people. And I also want to mention air quality in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, because if some of you will be aware that the cobalt mining that's required, <coughs> and I'm covered in an article today indeed by the the, the, the daily record, and if I read uh, an extract from that, I quote, in hellish dusty mines, children as young as 10 scrape fragments of cobalt from the dirt and intersack with their bare hands, inhaling poisonous and metal metallic particles. Um, so we do need to change the system, and we don't need to replace one system with another. I listened carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary said in relation to buses, and he made a, a number of very important points, and I've got the details here of the, the money that has been expended in relation to that. He didn't mention bus patronage. And if we are going to change, we need to get people onto buses. Now, I know there's a transport bill. It's not ambitious. Some of us want to make it more ambitious. Um, the, the challenge, of course, with bus travel that we heard repeatedly from all the witnesses coming to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee was that congestion is an issue. Congestion is an issue. It holds up buses, and of course there are mechanisms in place in the form of bus lates and, and gates and priority light systems, but that affects people. People are not going to, to get a bus between places if they can walk quicker between them. So um, the, the mode of propulsion is a factor but it's not, uh, it's not the, the way ahead. The, the new technology, and if I compare, because the, again, without being too parochial, the electric A9, well, how about the Highland main line, the railway line that runs right beside the A9? And if you compare the three billion expenditure expected to, to be uh, uh, put in place in respect of that, and another three billion for across the A96, compare that with the fact that we are going to have diesel locomotives uh, with a 30, 40 year lifespan, and I'm all in favor of reusing and repairing, but it's not like with like, it's not like with like, and the, the cabinet secretary will be sick of me talking about rail, but um, the, the reality of the situation is that 25.3% of the rail network in Scotland is electrified. That's really good, that's really good. No percent of the Highland main line is electrified with no plans so to do. And of course, the, the, the benefit of electrification that applies in relation to uh, road travel applies equally in relation to rail travel. I want to touch very briefly on the automotive industry because it's very clearly a, a, a very powerful lobby. And I'm one of the many people who feel quite let down because thought they were doing the right thing a number of years ago, buying a diesel vehicle, in fact, possibly stalled to buy a, a diesel vehicle only to, to be told you're a a dirty polluter. So there is an issue of, uh, of confidence and confidence in what we've been told. And this will apply to some of the new technologies as well. So whilst I'm not uh, in any way technical and I hear what people say about hydrogen, it, we need to have a very clear evidence base uh, for, for all future decisions. I'll leave it there just now. Thank you. Thank you. And I can now call Liam MacArthur to speak to move the amendment in his name. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by thanking the Transport Secretary for bringing this motion and allowing um, us to start 2019 with this uh, important debate. And in the context of the recent lack of progress uh, we've seen in reducing emissions in the transport sector, I think the question of how we accelerate the take up of ultra low emission uh, vehicles has taken on a greater significance, importance, and indeed uh, urgency. And I recognise and welcome many of the steps that have been taken and were laid out uh, by the uh, Transport Secretary earlier, as well as the proposals of where we go next, uh, including uh, the electric A9 and moves to create low emissions zones in various cities across Scotland. I'm slightly concerned uh, that the government's motion comes across uh, as a little self-congratulatory and left unamended. Uh, uh, this, I think, risks uh, fostering uh, complacency, which in turn uh, would see Scotland fail to achieve what we should be aspiring uh, to achieve. And therefore, I think it's encouraging uh, that a range of amendments have been lodged by colleagues across all of the other uh, parties that have passed. We'd make, I think, a more meaningful statement of intent by this, uh, by this parliament on an issue which is, uh, and Jamie Green reminded us rightly, um, commands strong cross-party support. And I'll address the proposal set out in my own amendment shortly, but uh, before assessing what we need to be doing going forward, I think it is perhaps reflecting uh, for a moment on where things stand at present. Yes, progress has been made in terms of the take-up of electric and other low-emission vehicles over recent years, supported by a welcome expansion of the charge point network. 
However, before we get carried away patting ourselves on the back, we should reflect on how this measures up in comparison uh, to what has been happening elsewhere, particularly uh, in Europe. The truth is we compare favourably uh, with very many, but fall well short of those who are leading the way. The Netherlands is a prime example. In eight years, they've gone from 400 charge points to 18,500. In Scotland, we sit around, as the Transport Secretary reminded us, uh, touching on 1,000. Norway, Denmark, Switzerland, Austria uh, are similarly ahead of the game. As for take-up of low-emission vehicles, Norway has sig uh, successfully gone from 1% of the overall car pool in 2014 to 10% uh, by 2018, with uh, more ambitious targets uh, for uh, the phasing out of diesel and petrol vehicles. Again, this shows what can be achieved with the right level of political ambition, supported by a mix of legislation, policy and incentives. So we need to scale up our ambitions. We need to do this to meet our environmental objectives. We need to do it to capture the economic opportunities. And we need to do it to deliver the social and health benefits too. As Colin Smith's amendment rightly points out, air pollution is a killer. It contributes to around 40,000 uh, premature deaths in the UK each year and costs the NHS billions. That is simply unacceptable. It is also unsustainable. And having criticised the self-congratulatory tone of the government's motion, uh, I uh, am hesitant about reminding the Chamber that Orkney continues to have the highest proportion of EVs of any community in Scotland. However, as the Transport Secretary will be aware from our recent meeting with representatives of the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum and Orkney Islands Council, there is unquestionably an ambition, a desire and a strategy for going much, much further. This, I think, illustrates perfectly uh, the point that is made in today's motion about the leadership being shown by local authorities and other organisations, not just in Orkney, uh, but across the country. In Orkney, through the efforts of the Council, ORF and others, we're seeing the focus now extending beyond merely an expansion in the take-up of low-emission cars and buses. Projects are well underway to develop the next generation of hydrogen-powered ferries, while discussions uh, about low-emission alternatives on our lifeline air services are also taking place. Harnessing Orkney's abundant renewable resources to cutting-edge innovation will enable the islands to continue identifying solutions to the challenges we face from climate change through to fuel poverty. In turn, I've no doubt that these can uh, have a wider relevance and application over time. To make all this happen, however, will require more flexible and a long-term approach uh, to public funding. This was a point made during the recent meeting the Minister and I had with local Orkney st stakeholders. So too were concerns about the way in which the current charge point network functions. I know the Transport Secretary plans to review the current network, how it is used uh, and how it might be made to operate more effectively. I very much welcome that as part of an exercise in making sure that we have the right chargers in the right place and funded in the right way. At present, a lack of public confidence in range and reliability continues to hold back efforts to encourage take-up of low-emission vehicles. Combating those perceptions and building that confidence will require a charging network that is fit for purpose. We can't just replace the petrol station model. We need to be more creative, reflecting current patterns of usage, including the extent of charging at home. We will also need to take into account the increased demand on our grid and establish smarter ways of meeting that demand. Whatever the charge point network looks like in future, however, reliability will be critical. Uh, for whatever reason, possibly poor back office systems, faults are not being properly logged and then tracked by Charge Place Scotland at present. Communication with users and even owners of the charge points is inadequate and remedial action is not taking place in a timely fashion. That isn't good enough and undermines that public confidence. We must do better. The CPS contract is up for renegotiations in the near future and there's a perfect opportunity to get things right. I would therefore urge the Transport Secretary to set up an expert panel, including user groups uh, such as EVA Scotland, ORF and others with a practical interest in developing uh, the service to help inform the process going forward to ensure the specifications for the next contract address the shortcomings of the current one. Finally, I would urge the Scottish Government to work closely with UK counterparts to put in place a range of incentives that can stimulate take-up of ULEVs. This needs to involve creative use of the taxation system as well as properly targeted grants. These are the sorts of measures that can build public confidence, enabling Scotland to both raise and realise our ambitions in an area where we should aspire to not just be good, but world-leading. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now turn to the open part of the debate. Members have five minutes to make their contribution.
Julian Martin to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you very much, President Officer, and Happy New Year. Um, Scotland has got one of the world, some of the world's most ambitious targets when it comes to making our country a low-carbon economy. And as convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, it goes without saying how passionate I am about making sure we meet those targets. But as a rural MSP, I'm all equally as passionate that in doing so, rural communities should not be disadvantaged and should always be at the heart of any just transition decisions. And quite simply, if rural communities aren't included, we just won't get there. In the past decade, we've made huge strides towards the amount of ultra-low emission vehicles on Scottish roads. Um, we're, we're looking at about 10,000 at the moment uh, from last year, uh, compared to 495 vehicles in, recorded in 2011. And I'm one of the drivers that's made the leap. I drive a Kia Niro, one of the lowest emissions hybrid vehicles you, you can get in the market. And my, but my aim is to switch to fully electric once my lease is up and the charging infrastructure is in place in my rural community as part of the government's investment in charging stations. Presiding officer, it's the objective of the Scottish Government that by 2032, the need for petrol and diesel cars and vans will be phased out altogether. And that's a laudable goal, but for those of us in the areas of Scotland that are ill-served by public transport, life without a car would be nigh on impossible. I have but one railway station in my constituency's largest town of Inverurie, and that's 25 miles away from the second largest town, which doesn't have one, or indeed any of the other towns in my constituency. Rural areas need greener options, and you should not have to live in a city to be part of the carbon reduction revolution. I mean, I very much um, wanted to be part of that revolution my whole working life, but in the 10 years of commuting into Aberdeen with uh, small children, babies in the back of my car, it was simply impossible for me to use public transport when I had to get to nurseries and childminders as well to Aberdeen College. Um, and, and that was with somebody who really wanted to do it. So in October, October last year, I was in Iceland um, and speaking to their environment minister, Gurminder Gurbranson, about his government's decision to ban the registration of all new petrol and diesel cars from 2030, with a view to the country being electric only from 2050. In a small independent country, Iceland can of course take all the legislative and policy steps necessary to make that, but it's still a, a really ambitious policy and a really brave decision that they've made, because it's uh, very ambitious, but if it's not done carefully, it's potentially inequitable, uh, particularly for low earners. And to achieve a shared carbon emissions ambition, uh, governments have to ensure making it financially possible for all motorists to move from petrol and diesel vehicles to ultra low emission if it's to work. Um, Aberdeenshire East, the constituency I represent, is one where the public transport system is also very radial. The vast majority of buses head in towards the city of Aberdeen. Um, but for someone commuting between towns of Ellen, Turriff, or Meldrum, in Verurie, or a mum and dad, as I say, dropping their kid off at nursery or the kids at school, you simply can't wholly use public transport to do that. Those bus routes either don't exist, or they have a skeleton timetable. Um, speaking to my son about this, he's recently moved to Edinburgh as a child who's had to use buses his, his entire sort of teenage life, the, 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 the Aberdeenshire buses. One of the best things about studying Edinburgh, he says, is the buses. You know, um, it's, it's been part, part of, part of their, their life. It's been unreliable buses in Aberdeenshire messing up their day. Um, when I first got elected, that seemed to be the, the, the major case log I used to get from him and his friends about the buses. So moving on to the nearest, my nearest city, the Scottish Government has committed to making Aberdeen one of the four low emission zones in Scotland. And the proximity of the harbour to the city centre often means that there are freight lorries um, uh, that account for uh, a percentage of the city's traffic. And these often cause the most emissions. It's also hoped that our new Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route will also ease that congestion massively, moving the majority of heavy vehicles out of the city altogether. We're already, the Cabinet Secretary will be pleased to hear we're already seeing the benefits of that. Um, not having to sit in traffic in a city that you don't even want to go to to get from two rural locations, north and south of Aberdeen, um, isn't just a case of improving your journey time, but also making a big difference to the emissions as well. In Aberdeen City, of course, we've also got hydrogen buses that have been in use for a number of years. And only last year, a new hydrogen refuelling station was opened to the public, which allowed for the refuelling of cars and for vans, um, as well as trucks and, and, and buses. Presiding officer, we know that uh, transport contributes to more than a quarter of Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions, with the road sector accounting for the largest proportion of these. Um, cars, lorries, vans, buses, motorcycles, in 2015 alone, uh, emitted 9.6 megatons of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. And we need to tackle this. And like Iceland, 
topography of our country means we can't live without cars. Low emission vehicles are the future for communities like mine. But if we achieve our goals, they must be affordable to all motorists. And I look forward to seeing how we as a nation will be a leader in that regard and can sign carbon emitting cars for commuting to history. Thank you. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I'd like to refer members to my register of interest, specifically farming. The way the world is travelling is changing. The wheel has not been reinvented, and the engine that powers the wheel has been the thing that is being reinvented. There is a general switch over from petrol and diesel to electric vehicles, and sadly that's only in its infancy. But there is an area of inevitability about the scale of this change and how it will increase. It's therefore only right that the government prepare the way and ensure that our road networks are fully up to speed. That's why I cautiously welcome the Scottish Government's plan to the, add the extra 1,500 electric charge points across Scotland. It's a start, but it is, is it enough? And I think the answer is no, especially in rural areas. The Scottish Conservatives have set out the need to increase charge points in our small towns and rural areas where long journeys have become and are the norm. Without the right infrastructure, increasing the number of electric cars on our roads use will continue too slowly, and we need to stop that. Reports have shown that whilst 41% of people would consider buying an electric car, there are less than 1% that own an electric car. This is a huge gap, and this is what we all have to address. In rural areas, car drivers feel they cannot use an electric car to do the school run, or to get to work, or to make a hospital appointment, then I'm afraid they're going to stick with petrol and diesel. It's as simple as that, because there are few other options. And we shouldn't just be focusing on car users either. Small businesses face the same problem. They need vans and lorries to get their goods to the marketplace. In the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, we heard evidence that it would take up to 38 vans to redistribute food from an articulated lorry. Thus, if there are not sufficient vans and electric ones at that, then we're going to continue to have lorries entering potentially some of the most pollutest areas of Scotland. We need to get on and move the industry and the haulage industry away from diesel. And what is noticeable is there has been, in my mind, a lack of support for small business, as well as farm business, to transition to ultra-low emission vehicles. We shouldn't forget that farmers and other farm vehicles, which only make up 2% of the vehicles on our roads, but that's around 58,000 vehicles are working day and night to put high quality food on our plates. And the farmers are reliant on cheaper red diesel to operate the full array of farm machinery to grow and to harvest food. One thing's for sure that is that I believe the farming industry as a whole will require support to adapt to the, in, in the process and timescale that the Scottish Government has set out. The Scottish Government needs to be working with industry leaders to find a way forward. It can be done, but it needs a concerted effort. Pre Presiding Officer, we, today we are seeing ourselves congratulate ourselves on setting a target, but it's the delivery of that target which is going to be so important. We have a long way to go. There is much more to be done. What is important is that we as a Parliament take the lead in this and we work together to try and reduce our emissions across Scotland. Thank you. For Thank you. I call George Adam to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. You know, for once, my previous employment is actually of some use in a debate in the Parliament, uh, in the Scottish Parliament. And at this point, I'd like to record for the record, because people very lazily say a former used car salesman, I never sold a used car in my life, because my involvement was in corporate fleet and at the time I was involved in the industry, which was 11 years ago, it was actually 80% of the market was made up of fleet and corporate and only 20% was made up of uh, retail, which is quite unusual because people expect to walk into a car showroom and buy a vehicle. But the thing you've got to look at is the volume was actually in that 80%, not the profit. The profit was in you poor guys turning up at a dealership and uh, walking in and trying to get a car there. So when you look at it from that perspective, presiding officer, some, one of the negatives that people constantly say about electric vehicles is the cost, how much they cost. Now, my argument would be, as someone who has worked in the industry, this is in the beholden of the manufacturers themselves. 
because the manufacturers have the opportunity to actually discount the vehicle to such a way that they can get market share and they have done it in the past and model share make sure they get models in certain ways so there's a responsibility to the manufacturers themselves when it comes to electric vehicles the other problem we have is one that's already been mentioned has been that of battery power itself now, most of, I think, the most popular uh, car in the UK for the electric vehicle is the Nissan Leaf, and it's got a 250-mile range. But we all know in reality that's not necessarily the case, because it depends on your driving style, depends on the road you're on, it depends on uh, what you're going through in the weather as well, and how much power you've got to use. So I could probably struggle to get a vehicle from Paisley to Edinburgh and back in one charge. So that's a problem from the start, and I can only think how that would affect someone living in a rural uh, environment as well and one of the other issues that we have is okay the battery one's a technological one it's one we could probably solve as the technology gets better but as John Finney quite rightly correct, uh, said as well it's the component parts that are made up in these batteries as well that uh, is some of the problem if we're looking for a sustainable pro uh, future it's those who control the batteries and control where they go that's going to control the market and manufacturers have worked this out like Elon Musk is having a difficulty yes it's difficult to start a company from zero to somewhere overnight with Tesla cars, but he's not actually delivered in any of the targets that he's actually said as a manufacturer. Now, he's probably got more chance of reaching Mars with his other project than he has of reaching some of the car vehicle targets that he's made. But in all honesty, that's what the motoring press would tell you. But I just read yesterday the fact that uh, Netherlands and Norway, Norway is uh, the biggest uh, market for Tesla in, the, in Europe, and the uh, Netherlands nearly beat them, and they were just 100 cars short, because companies like the major rental companies bought 8,585 8, vehicles. These are the kind of things, when I go back to the corporate ideal in the corporate world, this is what's going to make the difference, is when we get the kind of industry and the corporate world to think that way and look at these vehicles for go as a way for going forward. And, uh, this, but the Scottish Government can't actually achieve this all on its own. And they'll need to work in collaboration with transport uh, companies and industry and bus and haulage companies in particular. But one of the interesting things that's happened, I spoke to Craig Allen, who runs Paisley Taxi Company. It's one of the traditional Hackney companies. And he bought one of the new London cabs, the electric ones. Now, they're not called the London cab company anymore because although they have traditionally the, the old Hackney cab, they have moved on and they are now called uh, the London Electric Vehicle Company because they've seen the change. Their major market where they supply legislation has changed so dramatically that they have had to change how they do deal with their business. And I use that as a perfect example of how legislation can make a difference in the future, how we can in this place dictate to those involved in the industry and manufacturers to change their ways, but so much so that TX, uh, the new TX was manufactured at a new facility in Anstry near Coventry, purpose-built with a £325 million investment. Now, that just shows you that's the biggest investment in a UK car plant uh, uh, in the past 10, 15 years. And it shows you that if we as legislators can make these changes, however small and however, uh, whatever way we can do that. One of the other interesting things, I, I got in touch with some of the companies, ironically, the ones I used to work for never got back to me. I don't know what that says. But uh, the one in particular that was quite interesting was Nissan in itself, because they actually talked about how they're a market leader, how they see, they're actually, it's Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi Alliance, and they say that they've sold 490,000 EV vehicles worldwide. But they said, in addition to this, as a leader in charging infrastructure, Nissan has more than 2,300 quick charge stations in Europe, which this number is pre uh, predicted to increase to 5,500 by 2020. So it shows you the companies are actually making that I, they're moving that way as well. So I think it's a case of us making sure that we work with them and we work as legislators to do our job. And then we can actually make this. I don't see the, the problems that other colleagues say. I think we can get this right. And I can sh I almost guarantee that come uh, the next round of cars that we're all buying, the vast majority is all buying electric vehicles. Thank you. Can I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by John Scott? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Ultra low emissions vehicles, as we're hearing this debate, are a really important part of a reimagined and progressive transport system for Scotland's future. Many of us consider environmentalism when taking our daily transport decisions, and many of us also enjoy a higher quality of life. Uh, well, would enjoy a higher quality of life were we not surrounded by diesel and petrol cars when making journeys or trying to enjoy the outdoors. A future. Um, as, as such, where um, ULEVs 
are an accessible and affordable um, aspect of transport, combined with a far improved public transport and active travel provision, is a very positive one indeed. And I just point out that I read yesterday that Luxembourg is actually making public transport free. So there's a thought. Uh, Scotland should be continuing to work across government, local authorities, energy and transport companies on the further development of all these innovative technologies. Is the car still modernity's icon of freedom? Asked Ludwig uh, Hunter Tilney from the Financial Times. He's the pop music critic, actually. He reminds us of Chuck Berry singing Riding Along in My Automobile as the ultimate cool in 1956. And he goes on, even when reality involves traffic jams and honking horns, uh, um, driving has been made to seem liberating. Beep, 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 yeah, the Beatles chorused in Drive My Car. But things are changing culturally, as he points out. When radio DJ Jeremy Vine, a prominent cyclist, wants to abolish the term drive time radio, as he says it celebrates a form of transport that kills 1,700 people a year on the UK's roads. So, to truly move towards a transport system fit for the future, we need a full modal shift of our transport systems to step away from the saturation of cars and vans. There is still a massive improvement that this government and Scotland has the power to make. Low emission zones should be an important part of this delivery, but the opportunity has not yet really been realised with the first in Glasgow being renamed a no ambition zone by Friends of the Earth Scotland, though more robust plans are being developed. Funding is still a concern. Just yesterday, I joined colleagues from Scottish Labour to demand that the ScotRail franchise be taken back into public ownership. We need to turn around this often chaotic service that we are paying for anyway, and instead of making it work, instead we should be making it work for passengers, our environment, and for the working people on the railways. This chamber should also recognise the impact of delivery vehicles and the need for consolidation hubs with connected final mile arrangements. And I welcome the briefing from UPS who call for the government to support an innovative urban delivery system such as walking, cycling and delivery logistics and I would add small, small van uh, low emission vehicles as well. And I would welcome comment on this from the Minister. For too long, air pollution, as we've heard from Colin Smith and other colleagues, has perhaps been considered a necessary evil to continue to enjoy the ease of diesel and petrol vehicles. The damage air pollution causes to our health, communities, commuters, and the more vulnerable, old and young, is surely a strong motivating factor to move towards ULEVs. In 2014, pollutants in the air contributed to over 2,000 deaths and there are schools within 150 metres of illegally polluted streets in Aberdeen and Edinburgh and, and Glasgow. In its 2018 progress report to Parliament, the UK Committee on Climate Change placed transport as the government's biggest sectoral challenge. That transport emissions, even excluding international aviation and shipping, increased between 2015 and 16, is a mockery. And as the climate change spokesperson for my party, I can celebrate the target to phase out diesel and petrol uh, cars by two 2032, uh, but there still needs to be a more strongly robust Scottish Government plan in our view. There's been much discussion about charging points, infrastructure today and elsewhere, and we have a planning bill moving to stage three. Should there be an obligation through the planning system for new build housing, commercial and public buildings to have incorporated charging points with a lead in time? My thanks go to Smart Energy GB for highlighting the role a smarter electric grid could play in this. Whatever the fuel, congestion in our towns and cities is unpleasant and it's frustrating. For shorter journeys, the government needs to make active and public transport the easiest and most attractive way. And I want to say something very briefly about rural issues. While rural very poverty briefly, can be hidden in small pockets, there are real difficulties for many in rural areas. And I, I believe that there is a, a case to be made for interest-free loans for low-income rural dwellers to get modern wheels where public transport will never go. Thank you. That was brief. Thank you. Uh, call John Scott to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and as an historic rural dweller and owner of a rural business and also say that I welcome this debate today on ultra-low emission vehicles. 
Certainly this debate is appropriately timed, being held only eight days after the introduction of Scotland's first low emission zone in Glasgow on the 31st of December 2018, thereby delivering on the last day possible on the Scottish Government's commitment to introduce an LEZ in Glasgow in 2018. And without doubt, transport and the use of low emission vehicles will have a very important part to play in keeping greenhouse gas emissions to a minimum. And while today's debate has largely focused on low emission car use, it is important to note that emissions will need to reduce significantly from other modes of transport as well to meet future climate change targets. And in that context, we have to look at aircraft design, where currently technology is looking at and leading to the development of hybrid aeroplanes. We need to look at trains, where innovative thinking is developing the use of hydrogen as the next generation fuel of choice with trains already in service in Europe using hydrogen as a fuel instead of diesel, where electrification is not an option. And we also need to take a realistic look at shipping, particularly ferries, as mentioned by others, also a huge producer of carbon. And without doubt, the potential for the use of hydrogen as a fuel on board ships is a growing opportunity as well. Turning now to low emission vehicle use in Scotland, we have heard today that the Scottish Government is pinning its hopes on phasing out petrol and diesel car use in Scotland by 2032, which is only 13 years away. Certainly this is an ambitious target, but the important point is, is it achievable? And the answer to that question, is it feasible, is entirely a function of investment. That the technology largely exists to deliver on this 2032 target is a welcome fact and we are not depending on future inventions to meet ambitious targets arbitrarily set. However, I'm not certain that the scale of investment proposed thus far by the Scottish Government matches their ambitions. The cost of incentivising and delivering on the 2032 target will fall more and more on the Scottish taxpayer, therefore. For most, at the moment, hybrid and electric cars are currently unaffordable. And while many would be happy to use electric and hybrid vehicles, most are not able to afford to do so. Now, of course, the Scottish Government may propose by legislation and punitive taxation to drive current vehicle types from our roads and encourage modal shift onto buses, trains and bicycles. But that will require a willingness to change from the people of Scotland that currently does not exist with electric vehicles representing less than 1% of ownership, as already discussed. And low emission zones in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Dundee will be an early test on how the Scottish car driving public will react to low emission zones and by extension the use of low emission vehicles. And difficult as this problem of either modal shift or affording electric cars will be for city or urban dwellers, it will be significantly more difficult for those living and working and running businesses in rural Scotland, as others have referred to. Bus usage is falling across much of urban Scotland and is becoming almost non-existent in rural Scotland, a real problem, and Colin Smith referred to this. Networks of electric vehicle charging points will be created, reasonably enough, in our towns and cities and on our busiest road routes, and I welcome the start of electrifying the E9 before Christmas. A welcome to the Scottish Government's ambition to eliminate range anxiety for electric car users by 2022, and certainly that will be essential if ownership of electric or hybrid vehicles is to increase from its current very low base. Because, presiding officer, people will not switch to electric or hybrid vehicle use unless and until that reassurance is in place. And if that happens by 2020, too, I will of course be delighted, but it will mean that at that point only 10 years will remain before the 2032 target is to be achieved. So, Presiding Officer, in conclusion, while we support in principle the Scottish Government's push towards the uptake of low emission vehicles of all types, the people of Scotland will not expect to be seriously out of pocket, particularly rural Scotland, if they are expected to change their habits of a lifetime. The people of Scotland will need to be persuaded towards doing the right thing for the environment rather than coerced or bullied into a position many currently do not adhere to. Thank you.
Thank you. I must tell members I've got to be very tight with time because we've the statement to follow at 4.30. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, presiding officer, uh, I declare I'm Honorary President of the Scottish Association for Public Transport, Honorary Vice President for Rail Future uh, UK. Uh, I listened with interest to George Adam on the subject of taxis. I recall six years ago when I was across giving evidence to the Irish Parliament's uh, uh, the rural committee uh, that I travel back to the airport in a Nissan Leaf um, electric vehicle and uh, the driver told me that he could drive all around Dublin and do all his transport uh, on a single charge. So the technology has been with us a while and early adopters, he was actually given this taxi by Nissan to prove that it could do this. Uh, so he was really enthusiastic because he got the car for nothing. Uh, but uh, it was a, a good example. Um, it's, it's worth saying that the Tory uh, amendment uh, talks about standards uh, for charging, and I think that's a proper uh, thing to engage. I just am very uncertain as to whether we're yet ready to set what the standard is. Um, there's DC charging, there's AC charging. There's nine different physical connections you can make in different charging points. Um, we've got 150 kilowatt charging points are coming in in this year. We've got 350 kilowatt charging points will come in in about one year or 18 months. The standards are probably not stable enough for us to choose the winner. So I think we can set uh, a, a way forward, however, because we can have standard of physical connection. That would be helpful. We could have standard over the logical messages that travel between the charging station and the vehicle that's being charged. And we could build in to a standard future proofing that means it will accommodate future changes. And I think it's time to do that. It's worth going back 100 years ago uh, when electricity to domestic premises and industrial premises, there were no standards. Every, every electricity company had a different plug design. Some of them were DC, some of them were AC. They ran on different voltages. They ran to different uh, fusing standards. Some of them had no fuses in their systems at all. So we're in that era that we now uh, need to uh, move out of. I suspect I don't have time, do forgive me. Um, uh, Claudia Beamish talked about planning and domestic houses. I know that my colleague Richard Lyle for some time has been banging on about councils could do it now couldn't make it a planning condition uh, for new developments that they put in terminals, and I think that'd be a good idea. Um, now, uh, Liam uh, MacArthur, I hadn't realized uh, Orkney had the greatest density of electric vehicles. I did look, because of his amendment, and I saw there were seven charging points in Kirkwall, so I was going to wind them up on that, but I now discover there's a perfectly good reason uh, for that. I, I, of course, look forward to the Logan Air Islanders becoming electric aircraft in about three years' time. Um, the new Audi e-tron is 408 brake horsepower. Uh, the Islanders require uh, 520 brake horsepower. So it's well within the compass of what is available and working now. And when you put electric uh, engines in the Islanders, they will reduce the weight so it'll be easier to fly. And by the way, the top speed of the island is about the same as the new Audi, uh, which has over 200 uh, mile uh, range. Now, a lot's happening in public transport uh, in the central belt. We've got uh, new electric trains. Yesterday, my journey down to Parliament, I had an HST, loved it, uh, down to Aberdeen on the Inverness to Aberdeen line. Uh, it's still a classic, but not yet refurbished, but still super. A 170 down to Edinburgh, but a lot of those are HSTs, and a 385 here. The railways are absolutely super. They're not perfect everywhere, but my journey is, by goodness, I wouldn't go back 10 years uh, for anything. Now, we're talking about ultra-low emission vehicles. Nobody's mentioned ferries. We've got the first electric ferries. Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. I beg. I, I saw it in the corner. My hand go up. Uh, electric ferries. We're doing that. Well, nobody has mentioned electric bicycles uh, because getting more people onto electric assisted bicycles would help people's exercise, but also uh, an, another way in which we might, might, might help things. I may say that, uh, of course, uh, getting involved in transport is an is a almost instinctive thing. Uh, my first motorised transport was my piler, otherwise known as a bogey or a kerti, 
uh, which we used to put the motor mower in front of to tow us around the back garden. Amazing we didn't kill anybody with the, the blades going. This is an excellent debate. Uh, I look forward to my next uh, vehicle being an electric one in about two years' time. I hope everybody else does the same. Thank you. I now call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. It is scarcely 100 years since transport in the Western world was revolutionised by the rise of the internal combustion engine, decisively replacing horsepower for the first time in history. Now, according to insiders quoted by the Financial Times at the end of December, we may have reached another milestone, the point at which global demand for vehicles powered by internal combustion engines will begin to go down. Predictions even a year ago were that the era of petrol and diesel would come to an end in the foreseeable future, but that demand for internal combustion vehicles would probably not peak until the 2020s. But experts now believe that the year of peak demand may in fact have been the year just ended in 2018. And just as the rise of the internal combustion engine reached a point when that became unstoppable, so the rise of alternatives to the internal combustion engine will also reach a tipping point, and that already is not far away. So, so action to support electric vehicles is welcome, uh, uh, but it would be a mistake to put all our low emission eggs in a single electricity basket. While an infrastructure for charging electric cars is important, a different approach will be required to tackle the largest and most polluting internal combustion engines. These include diesel-fueled buses and trucks and diesel locomotives on our railways. There is increasing evidence that the most efficient way to phase out those vehicles here and around the world will be by developing hydrogen as the low emission fuel of choice in public transport and in freight. On a global scale, Japan leads the way. The local authority in Fukushima, for example, is building a new hydrogen production plant on a site originally zoned for a new nuclear power station. The fuel source in that case is electricity generated from solar panels, while Japan is also pioneering the production of hydrogen from human waste. One expert reckons that biogas extracted from sewage sludge could power nearly 2 million hydrogen fuel cell vehicles across Japan in the near future. The athletes village for the 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games will be powered by hydrogen from Fukushima. And for the first time, hydrogen will be the fuel of the Olympic torch itself. What the Japanese government and business wants now is to promote global collaboration in order to grow hydrogen technology while cutting costs. And that is where Scotland could and should come in. The Cabinet Secretary has referred to Aberdeen, which has built up the largest fleet of hydrogen-powered buses in Europe with Scottish Government support. The vehicles are owned by the City Council. They are operated by First Aberdeen and Stagecoach alongside conventional diesel-fueled buses. <coughs> hydrogen buses require a hydrogen fuel point, which the Council provides at Kitty Brewster. That's also already been mentioned. And that fuel point, in turn, has allowed the use of hydrogen to fuel cars and vans too. The next stage could be hydrogen production, fueled by renewable electricity generation. Major new offshore wind farms like Aberdeen Bay will generate more power at some times than the grid can use. Like solar power and biogas in Japan, offshore wind in Scotland can be the feedstock for hydrogen production uh, to fuel buses and trucks and much else beside. These developments will need willing partners, hydrogen technology companies, renewable energy generators, local authorities like Aberdeen City Council and the Scottish Government too. If Scotland is to be a producer as well as a consumer, we certainly cannot afford to stand still. The land of Lower Saxony in Germany deployed the world's first hydrogen train last September, replacing diesel locomotives on 100 kilometres of non-electrified tracks close to Germany's North Sea coast. Alstom, which also builds France's TGVs, expects to deliver 14 hydrogen trains to Lower Saxony by 2021. Even closer to home, plans were revealed only this week for hydrogen-powered trains on the Greater Anglia network in England, replacing diesel but using locomotives originally built for electric trains some 30 years ago, with a range of 1,000 kilometres similar to a diesel train and a maximum speed of 87 mph, again similar to a diesel train. 
create the campaign for rail electrification in Aberdeen to Edinburgh, has long argued for extending the infrastructure for electric trains north of the central belt. But now hydrogen offers another option. That option is the 21st century steam train, where the only emissions are steam and water. And just as Scotland should build on its strong position in hydrogen bus transport, so we should look to lead the way in hydrogen trains on the three quarters of the Scottish rail network which have not been electrified. And there you must conclude. I'm sorry, I must be very firm. Please, thank, thank please, you very thank much. You very and, much. Uh, very much. Thank I you want very to much. get everybody in who's been sitting waiting to debate. Angus MacDonald followed by Finlay Carson, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Scotland as a nation is changing in many ways. Change in most circumstances is welcome and the changes we are seeing in the, in the advancements of our infrastructure is something we should all be proud of uh, and proud to support. Of course, the, the driving force, to, to coin a phrase behind many of the, the changes we've heard about so far, is the rapid pace of technological advancements and the growing popularity of low or zero carbon emission vehicles. And as we've heard er earlier, uh, Scotland is at the forefront uh, of these changes and we're doing more now to embrace support and enhance our infrastructure to allow this to happen than ever before. In 2011, the commercialization of electric vehicles was limited to only a few very expensive types. The technology, which had been around for decades, had only uh, started to become more accessible and affordable for large-scale production. By the end of 2011, 495 ULEVs were licensed in Scotland. And now if we fast forward to quarter three in 2018, that number's increased by over 2,000% to 10,360. In the same time, we've seen our infrastructure improved and grow to accommodate such an increase in the uptake of these vehicles. Now, you're never too far from the nearest public charging point. Uh, for example, with motorists on average 2.78 miles away from their nearest point, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in his opening speech. But what he didn't mention is that the average across Britain is 4.09 miles. So while there is much progress to be made, uh, we're still ahead of the game, at least in the UK. Um, <clears throat> now, in addition, with the Scottish Government's Charge Place Scotland live interactive map providing real-time information on the position and status of each public charge point, it's clear to see the progress made in the face of a rapidly advancing area of transportation. So, um, clearly, President Officer, the motion we're debating today refers to the electric A9, a, a road that I use often um, to head to Alapu, an, an innovative and welcome step in the right direction for ULEVs and further progress towards phasing out the need for new petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2032. Now, <clears throat> as part of this project and with funding from the Low Carbon Travel and Transport Challenge Fund, which is part of the uh, ERDF, a Falkirk Council has received funding to build a 20-unit electric vehicle recharging hub at the Falkirk Stadium, which will be powered by a 168-panel solar canopy. So not only is it lowering the carbon footprint of the motorists, but the power will be generated uh, from a sustainable source as well. Similar hubs will be placed along the entire route, the A9 from, uh, as I mentioned, Falkirk Stadium all the way to Scrabster Harbour, allowing urban and rural communities and businesses the opportunity to access EV charging points. Uh, now, it would be remiss of me, President Officer, to speak in this debate on the subject of ULEVs without mentioning those vehicles which hold more than six or eight passengers. Of course, uh, Scotland's road network does not just accommodate cars, but our network of buses work hard to get people to where they need to be on a daily basis, uh, not always um, as efficiently as we would like, um, but that's something that can be worked on. Uh, and as an aside, I'll be happy to see the transport bill contain provisions to bring bus routes into the hands of the public again, or at least local authorities, ensuring that services are focused purely on passengers and not for profits, but that's a topic for another day. Presiding officer, when we look at buses in Edinburgh here, uh, for example, it's clear to see that there are a few of them without the trademark noise and smell from the traditional diesel engine, which leads me to another Falkirk district connection, the advent by local bus builder Alexander Dennis of their ADL Enviro range of vehicles. Uh, now, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary won't mind me giving ADL, uh, situated in his constituency, a plug. Uh, given that a large number of the workforce are resident in my constituency. But with the single-deck Enviro 200 model available in an electric variant and the double-deck Enviro 400 models available in biogas, hybrid, and recently announced hydrogen fuel cell variants, these are all low- and zero-emission solutions to the decarbonisation 
of our road transport networks. And incidentally, I very much welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to continue the Green Bus Fund. ADL are clearly beneficiaries as well as other bus builders of that fund. Um, President Officer, I'm aware that I'm running uh, fast out of time. So uh, to close, um, just to say Scotland is a small nation that's always had a reputation for being innovative and ambitious. It's no different with this government's ambition for ULEVs in our communities, and it's thanks to the work of the government and its partners that we're building a country fit for the future, whatever may lie ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by John Mason. Mr Mason will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Carson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to speak on what is a hugely topical subject. For me, it's important for two main reasons. Firstly, as a member of the Eclair Committee currently scrutinising the Climate Change Bill, but also as an MSP for the rural constituency of Galloway in Western Fries. While the Cabinet Secretary correctly paints an improving picture regarding the introduction of ultra-low emission vehicles, in reality progress has been painfully slow. In a frighteningly short 13 years, this SNP government planned to phase out new petrol and diesel vehicles in favour of electric vehicles in a bid to hit its ambitious low emission targets. Currently, however, only 1% of almost 3 million cars on the road in Scotland are electric. Of course, we welcome the commitment to phase out petrol and diesel vehicles, and I know that the SNP will point to the fact that UK government plans are eight years less ambitious, but we have yet to see uh, detail from the SNP government on how they will, in practice, achieve their earlier 2023 target. We need to know what it will mean in practice for car and van owners and what national and local infrastructure will be put in place. We don't have detailed information on the proposed LEZs in our cities. Indeed, even in our largest city of Glasgow, where a low-emission zone has recently been rolled out, the Strathclyde Partnership for Transport have warned that significant investment will be needed to ensure buses in the city will meet the required standards by the end of 2022. If significant investment is needed in our cities, just how much will be needed to ensure this transition works in rural areas? What infrastructure needs to be put in place so that our rural communities are fully prepared? Planning future infrastructure in rural areas must be urgently addressed uh, for the whole of Scotland to be successfully uh, involved in the transition to an electric future. We have all seen the headline-hitting announcements surrounding the A9, but even with that, there was little detail on the government's electric highway plan, which formed just a single sentence in the programme for government document in 2017. So what's the national plan? We need to ensure that drivers have the information and support to give them confidence to travel the country without experiencing range anxiety. With the Port of Cairn Ryan in my constituency, the road haulage industry is hugely important to the local economy. The Scottish Government must outline plans on how they will support this industry in transitioning to low emission vehicles. Load haulage companies using the major trunk roads such as the A77 and A75 need to have confidence that they will, in the new age of electric, not only be sustainable environmentally, but economically. The need to get this transition right first time round cannot be understated. The Scottish Conservatives Environment and Climate Change paper sets out a range of measures which would encourage and accelerate the uptake of electric vehicles. We've outlined plans to establish a fund that would expand electric charging points in small towns, rural areas and train stations because having greater access to charging points as soon as possible will help to give rural constituents confidence that electric cars will be an alternative option sooner rather than later. At the moment, with range anxiety, I'm not convinced that the thought of switching to an electric car is one that many of my constituents accommodate at the moment. Our paper also outlines plans that would require all public bodies to conduct a cost-benefit analysis of replacing existing fleets with electric cars. The Clare report into uh, air quality in Scotland recommend recommendations do go some way to addressing the challenges and opportunities of the inevitable transition to a low emission future, which will have great economic but also secondary benefits for our health and communities. Deputy Presiding Officer, it's time for the SNP government to stop coasting and start to accelerate down this road of opportunity to cleaner, greener Scotland before we miss the proverbial bus. Thank you very much. And I'll call on John Mason. Mr Mason, three minutes, please. Last speaker in the open debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I do understand that our focus today is probably on road vehicles. But others, as others have mentioned, trains uh, are also vehicles, by my understanding. 
and the increasing electrification of the network is a tremendous way of reducing emissions. I suppose I am, like many people, someone who is a little bit sceptical about some of the promises made in favour of new technologies. Let's see how it works out in practice. However, I do have a friend with an electric car who took me out for a run, and I have to say I was very impressed. And for me, that is one of the key challenges in switching to an electric car. Can it get me from Glasgow to Inverness without a charge? And if it does need a charge, is that going to be fast and dependable? I think that's what range anxiety means in the Tory amendment. So I think for a driver like me who is open but skeptical, we need to get the infrastructure in place, and we also need to build up public confidence in that infrastructure. As we're mentioning the A9 quite a lot, particularly between Perth and Inverness, I think the lack of service stations is definitely a problem. I realize the desire to give support to local communities rather than having people bypass them. However, I have to say that if I'm heading for Inverness for work or whatever, I do not want to begin to pit Lochry or Ravi Moor and getting bogged down with tourists, either to buy petrol or to charge my electric car. Now, please don't get me wrong, these are nice places, eh, but I don't think they fulfill the role of service stations. Battery technology is clearly one of the challenges in all this, and I understand that that would be one of the reasons why hydrogen buses have been trialled in Aberdeen eh, as an alternative to electric vehicles. And I have to say that hydrogen appeals to me for a number of reasons, eh, although I accept the technology may not be as far advanced and the costs may still be higher than using electric vehicles. Wind power is becoming our staple renewable along with hydro, but one of the challenges is clearly how to store the energy, even if it can be generated very cheaply. However, another option is to use electricity from wind power to produce hydrogen through electrolysis. It seems to me that has a number of advantages, including it is easier to store than electricity, speed of refueling, and potentially has multiple uses, including na replacing natural gas in the grid. Presiding officer, I don't want to uh, use up all of my huge amount of time that I have available. I think I personally am not quite ready yet to replace my petrol car with an electric one. But I am open to the possibility and a bit of persuasion. I think I'm maybe like others in the public uh, like that. I suspect I'm not unusual and a fair number of the public are waiting to see how things develop. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, regrettably, four members are not in for closing speeches. I will be naming them at the end. One's just shot in. That's fine. Uh, if you're recharging, you should have been in here before. Um, I call Liam MacArthur to close the Liberal Democrats. Mr MacArthur, a tight six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Obviously, I would like to have started with a declaration of interest as a, an EV uh, or even a ULEV uh, owner. I am not that um, yet. I have been weighing up over the last year or so uh, the advantages and the, and the potential disadvantages and certainly hope later on uh, this year and by the time we have uh, the next debate on this topic uh, to be able to um, uh, with some pride declare uh, that interest. I think Gillian Martin uh, was absolutely right to set down that challenge in terms of the leadership uh, that we should be taking. The, the Cabinet Secretary indicated that the government carpool is soon to go out to procurement of, of EVs. I mean, I would observe that we are some way down the course, and this is hardly a leadership position that the government is taking in this respect. And, and I think the importance and the function of that leadership was summed up very well in what was, I thought was an excellent speech by, by George Adam. The leadership that corporates can take through their purchasing process, through, through, the, through their leasing arrangement, but the leadership that we as policymakers and legislators uh, can take uh, in terms of sending a clear signal of where legislation and regulation is going and allowing vehicle manufacturers, uh, component manufacturers, uh, time to innovate and respond to those uh, public policy uh, messages. I thought the Cabinet Secretary very fairly set out um, some of the signals in his opening remarks uh, of the progress that's been made and, and, and reasons uh, to take encouragement. And I think all of those were entirely uh, legitimate. We're seeing that in terms of the take up of ULEVs. We're seeing it in terms of the expansion uh, of the charging network. I think in, in relation to some, we are showing a competitive uh, and a comparative advance, uh, advantage. I would 
however, uh, perhaps observe that whether or not the yardsticks should be the rest of the UK or those who are genuinely out in front uh, in this respect, such as Norway and Netherlands that were mentioned by a number of colleagues uh, in their contributions. And, and I think um, it is very much in our own interest. Uh, again, a number of uh, contributors to the debate have pointed to not just the environmental imperative and benefits that arise from pursuing this path, but the economic advantages that come with it and the benefits in terms of uh, social and health improvements. And, and again, I very much welcome the contribution made by Colin Smith, um, it, highlighting the impact uh, of air pollution, highlighting the impact in terms of health inequalities, the premature deaths that result uh, from this and the billions uh, uh, of cost to our NHS uh, each year. I welcome to the, um, the, the, the contribution made by Jamie Green in highlighting uh, the specific challenges in uh, remote and rural areas, those are ones I would very, uh, very much accept. I think Gillian Martin likewise uh, called on, on rural areas being able to play their full part uh, in this green revolution. And again, I would echo those sentiments entirely. That range anxiety, the, 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 the reliability anxiety is perhaps more keenly felt in those rural uh, areas. But I, I would say that, that the Orkney perhaps stands an as an example of a, a rural and island area uh, which has, has, has really has embraced um, the, the take up of, of, of EVs, is seeing that pushed out into other areas of, of transport as well. So I think there are ways of, of overcoming that anxiety and I would probably extend uh, an invitation to Stuart Stevenson to the inaugural Logan Air Inter Islands flight in two or three years time uh, in that electric uh, aircraft. Um, I, I think we've, we've talked about the, the, the charge point network has been critical uh, to addressing that, that range anxiety. Angus MacDonald um, uh, highlighted the, the, the uh, Charge Place Scotland map, which is beneficial, but it's only beneficial insofar as it is accurate um, in real time. And I think there have been enough uh, concerns raised over the piece to suggest that that's not always the case, uh, to, to, to suggest that uh, I think what we need is in the new contract with CPS or whoever, um, specifications that are informed by uh, users who have the experience, I think, to ensure that those problems are addressed going forward. Much of the focus has been on uh, electric vehicles, of course, but uh, again, um, the, the role played, or the potential role played by, by hydrogen um, has been emphasised by many, particularly when it comes uh, to public transport through buses, through, through ferries. Um, but again, it's not just the, the, the mode of propulsion, and I think John Finney made a fair point in suggesting whatever the technology, there's a need also to see a, a shift onto public transport and the provision of public transport, frankly, in some areas where it doesn't uh, currently exist. So I'd very much welcome uh, this afternoon's debate. It has been, I think, a forward-looking way of starting um, the uh, 2019. Um, it's been consensual. I think there's been plenty of food for thought uh, over the course of this afternoon. But I think the consistent message from most speakers has been as much as we welcome the progress that has been made, it's imperative that we, we raise our ambitions, uh, that we show and we see real leadership uh, for the environmental, for the economic, for the social and health benefits that derive from that. I think there's cross-party support for that. I look forward to working with the Cabinet Secretary's officials, with colleagues who've contributed to this debate, to the councils, to the other organisations who are indeed um, taking leadership in this, uh, so that we can deliver the ultra-low emission future that we absolutely need to see. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, before I call uh, John Finney, can I say of the three culprits who came in together late, Claudia Beamish, John Scott and Gillian Martin, I've only had pen on paper from one. I think the other two ought to be applying pen to paper to explain why they didn't have the courtesy to be in for the beginning of Mr MacArthur's closing speech. It's a courtesy not just to me, but to the chamber and to the member. I now call on John Finney. Mr Finney, six minutes to close for the Greens. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. I, I think it's been a, a, an interesting debate. Um, I think there's been a, a wide range of views, a lot of them consistently uh, voiced. I thought the, the Cabinet Secretary started off and, and gave us a lot of technology. I think I said at the outset, I'm not a very technical man. I like simple things. I like um, buses, I like trains. Um, uh, so I, I, I hope perhaps in uh, closing up that the Cabinet Secretary, or indeed if it's the Minister, can perhaps talk about bus patronage because there is a concern that the um, Scottish Government seem quite resigned and accepting of the fact that it it's continues to drop. And uh, likewise, congestion which I alluded to in the implications for um, 
bus patronage connected with that. Trains and diesels I also alluded to, and um, um, I'm glad my colleague uh, Stuart Stevenson enjoyed his trip yesterday. Indeed, I saw he shared that with the public. I'll not be overly graphic, but just say, given the actual model, I hope he didn't make full use of the facilities, um, because that would be to the disadvantage of our very welcome uh, uh, rail workers. Um, Cabinet Secretary always used the, the phrase transition to a low carbon economy. It's a really good phrase. I, I actually like the word just transition added in front of it. And that's the name of our report that the Green MSK, MSPs commissioned a few years ago. And I like to think that you've read it and digested it fully and will act on its content, Cabinet Secretary. Because what we all want is a just transition. Um, and that doesn't come about by commending tax breaks for fossil fuel uh, multinational corporations. So we need to have consistency of approach. And that also applies to incentives, because I heard a great number of members talk about incentives, including Jamie Green talked about incentives. He suggested free parking. Well, maybe they'd like to speak to some of the, the very large corporations that run very large car parks to see if they'd be up for that. Or, more likely, as others, does he mean the public purse pays for, for that? Because we must understand, if we're having public expenditure, and, and, of course, uh, uh, freeing someone of the obligation to pay a charge is the same as having an um, expenditure. Um, we have, I must understand who the beneficiaries of that are. And, of course, there is a wider benefit to the community if we have people encouraged to use uh, um, these low-emission vehicles. Um, so a number of people talked about that. And also, um, J Julian Martin and... Uh, Claudia Mimbush talked uh, about, uh, um, and indeed the previous speaker mentioned this, the rural urban dimension. Well, uh, you know, I'm a car owner, and as many people have said, you cannot live in the country and, and not have a car, a car owner, uh, be a car owner. And there are very many challenges, very many challenges. But of course, what we have to remember too, is there's a sizable portion of our rural communities who are not car owners. 30% of households in Scotland are not car owners. And if all our policies, if all our policies are directed around a presumption of car ownership, then that's not healthy. Um, and there are, there are some important things to embrace about understanding that, the, that some things that uh, many would think are very simple have consequences. And I think the statistics that we heard from Edward Mountain about how many vans, for instance, are the equivalent of a, a heavy goods vehicle, that's important information that we need to digest. It's absolutely important information. And of course, that would apply. I'd far sooner see it in a, a container on a on a train, but of course the reality is that we do rely on motorised transport and will continue to rely on motorised transport regardless of the mode of propulsion. Now, like others, I found George Adams' speech possibly the most interesting um, uh, of today. I, 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 I thought understanding the relationship with markets, and it's not something that I always would imagine I'd find myself saying, I thought that was very interesting. The, the, the percentage of fleets versus personal ownership, I think, and the potential to drive policy using that approach, uh, I found uh, very helpful, um, and I thank him for that. I, I don't know if I conclude I'd be more or less likely to buy a motor vehicle from him, but probably, probably more likely. <laughs> probably more likely. So, uh, uh, again, turning to, to comments from my, my, my friend and colleague, Claudia Beamish, who, who mentioned deaths, and 2,000 deaths um, um, from, from emissions. And the, the statistic about the proximity of schools to many of these areas of high pollution, that is hugely important, hugely important. And, of course, this will, this will play a part. I think I mentioned, oh, no, I didn't mention, I meant to mention the climate um, change plan, which is no policies on the curb curbing private uh, motor car use and little on improving bus services. Indeed, as the uh, draft budget stands, it's a £7 million cut in that. And, and again, that won't help. That won't help at all the third of households uh, um, who uh, are no access to a motor vehicle. Um, and indeed, that plan, uh, as my colleague Mark Ruskell said, and I quote, the plan bizarrely assumes that even more traffic on our roads uh, with ministers pinning hopes and a magical overnight switch to electrical vehicles. Well, that, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I'm pleased that mention my colleague John Mason mentioned rail. I think that that's helpful. I want to mention Professor Philip Alston and his UN report, and it's been much quoted by the Scottish Government. And he says, transport, especially in rural areas, should be considered an essential service equivalent to water and electricity. And the government should regulate the sector to the extent necessary to ensure that people living in rural areas are adequately served. Abandoning people to the private market in relation to a service that affects every dimension of their basic well-being is incompatible 
with human rights requirements. And I'd hope we'd all agree that. In conclusion, in case I've been perceived as being very negative, I, I think as our amendment says, we recognise the important role that uh, vehicles can, these vehicles can play in decarbonising the, the transport sector. They won't affect um, congestion um, are, will, and won't uh, have a, a great impact on improving road safety, unlike my colleague Mark Ruskell's bill on 20 mile, and I hope the government will end up Thank you. You must Thank conclude you there. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Daniel Johnson to close for Labour. Six minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I I've hugely enjoyed this afternoon's debate, and it's one that comes indeed as something of a, of a relief. I think we're all too used to debating matters of the Constitution and various political crises. But this is a debate that actually, I think, is almost overdue. Because the issues raised in this topic and others, I think, are uh, hugely important in terms of Scotland's future, and our, uh, the, the economy of, of this country and how people work and live. And so I think there is an opportunity cost to these other things which are going on. And I think actually some of the issues in, uh, uh, that have been raised this afternoon have been about the need to actually really bring forward uh, solid plans to make sure that we embrace the opportunities and benefits that we have in front of us. Because I think it's all too easy to talk about electric vehicles, low emission vehicles, and look at that as some sort of lifestyle choice between different types of car, but it's actually much more profound and fundamental than that. What we're talking about is the glue of our economy, how we move around the transportation, how we both move ourselves, but also how goods and services are delivered is of fundamental importance to the economy. Many people have raised congestion through this afternoon's debate. Congestion costs the economy between one and two percent of the entirety of GDP. So getting a change like this right is of huge importance for the future of the economy and how people work. Likewise, 10% of people work in transport and distribution. So again, when we're contemplating the shift away from uh, hydrocarbon-based vehicles, that's of huge importance, not just about how we get to work, but also how all our goods are delivered around the country. And I think that that richness and the breadth of that debate has come out this afternoon. But I'd also just like to, I think, in a sense, I think, uh, focus this debate around the comments made by John Finney and Liam MacArthur, because I think between them, and it's not just bad habits from the Justice Committee uh, coming out here by referencing both of them, um, but, but I think the two points here is that, first of all, this has to be seen within a broader context. And yes, many of the things that we are doing are good, but as Liam MacArthur put it, they are not at the very best that they could be. Norway, a country of five million people, has the largest market for EV vehicles in the whole of Europe. The whole of Europe. The number of EVs uh, sold in Norway outstripped that of the entire of the UK year before last. I think UK might be on, on a par now. That is quite unbelievable. And that is where we, we need to look at uh, the, the size of the opportunity and making sure that we are in the, the very best. But likewise, I think John Finney is right, that we need to make sure that we're not just replacing locomotion. And this is why I, I raised the issue of, of automation. Because if all we do is simply replace petrol and diesel powered vehicles with battery powered ones, I think we'll be missing a trick. We'll be missing an opportunity. We'll certainly be missing an environmental one. And I think many colleagues have raised the issues around air quality and climate change, both of which are of profound importance. But actually, if you include automation, you have huge possibilities of increasingly improving the efficiency of how our roads are used. And that does bring those additional benefits because automated vehicles use our roads more efficiently. But uh, human drivers are prone to all sorts of errors and inefficiencies in terms of the way that people drive. Automated roads where the road space is allocated more efficiently, where vehicles talk to one another in real time sharing data, have a huge possibility of a, bit, a huge uh, economic uh, 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 advantages. And while I, I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that, that there is an issue around when these uh, uh, technologies are coming online, if we're talking about 2032, we are talking about similar and overlapping timeframes. So I think talking about the switch to EV without looking at the impact of other technologies in general, but I think on, of automation in particular, I think is potentially a mistake. Overall, a number of people have commented on the need to go further than the targets that we have in place. The 2032 targets are laudable. I think they're important. I think it's hugely important that we are ambitious, but we must go further. We need a robust plan that integrates targets along those lines, uh, 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 along with, I think, what has emerged in this afternoon's debate, three eyes. One around investment, 
investment in the, the, the infrastructure that's required, incentives for people uh, to, to uh, switch. Um, uh, 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 and uh, uh, so uh, with those three is investment uh, incentive and infrastructure, we, we, we will deliver the change that we need. But let me just talk briefly about uh, that infrastructure point. And I think it, it, uh, much has been made about the number of charging points and whether or not those are sufficient. I think that is hugely important. Uh, as it stands, uh, as I understand it, those targets would only mean that there would be one charging point for every 3,000 drivers. That is insufficient, and I think a number of speakers have brought out that point. But beyond that, we need to think about how those charging points are powered themselves. The it, it uptake of EVs is estimated to increase power consumption by 25%, and much of that being a very different type of usage because of the high drain that rapid charging requires. So we do need to look at the underlying uh, infrastructure requirements, the need for a smart grid, but we also need to look at the full spectrum of requirements, which I think the points made about hydrogen for freight and heavy goods, long distance uh, vehicles and transport, I think are also hugely important and well made. So we need a plan that integrates all of these things across all of these areas so that we get it right, that it's not just simply about targets, but we are actually learning from some very good examples that we have right here in Scotland, such as the A9 and Dundee Council, but we also make sure that those are extended and so the whole of Scotland can enjoy the benefits of the switch to electric vehicles. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I now call Alexander Burnett, close to the Conservative six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And as we've heard from members across the chamber, we're all committed to moving towards a low carbon economy and ultra low emission vehicles are very much part of that journey. Uh, so being the new year, I'd like to echo the goodwill shown by other members in the chamber on our first debate back by commending the Scottish Government for their pledge to expand Scotland's electrical charging infrastructure between now and 2022 so that range anxiety will become a thing of the past. Uh, now, this is particularly welcome in rural areas where the uptake of low electric vehicles is considerably lower than urban areas due to range anxiety. Uh, and as my colleague Jamie Green noted in his opening speech, the Scottish Conservatives have set out a number of measures in our environment and climate change policy paper published uh, in February 2017 to encourage the use and ownership of electric vehicles. Uh, and these range uh, from new incentives such as free parking, uh, the use of bus and taxi lanes by electric vehicles, establishing a fund to provide charging points in small towns, rural areas and train stations, a requirement for all bod public bodies to undertake a cost-benefit analysis uh, of replacing uh, vehicle fleets with electric vehicles, and providing support to transitioning buses and taxis to be powered by renewables. Now, all of this requires significant investment. And I'm pleased that the UK government is committed to investing more than 1.2 billion in the industry, as well as working with private investment. However, unfortunately, the uptake of electric vehicles in Scotland is nowhere near where it needs to be to achieve the SNP government's aim to phase out new petrol and diesel cars by 2032. Yet with electric vehicles accounting for only 1.77% of new vehicle registrations in 2016, up by just 0.09% from 2015, at this rate, it will take a 1,000 years for the SNP to achieve their goal. Worryingly, possibly after Tesla reaches Mars, uh, uh, as the experience of former car salesman George, George Adam pointed out. Uh, now, I know that SNP members, such as Angus MacDonald, drew attention to the fact that their aim to phase out diesel and petrol vehicles is eight years before the UK government. However, we have seen little detail on how the SNP government planned to do this. And it is clear that whatever initiatives they have in place to inc increase electric vehicle uptake, they are simply not working, perhaps with the exception of Orkney, uh, as Liam MacArthur was uh, keen to note. Now, a move to low emission vehicles does not necessarily mean a straight switch from diesel to electric and other subjects such as hydrogen, uh, uh, batteries and uh, automated uh, cars and, and roads uh, have been touched on and are probably subjects for another day given the reduced time for debate today. Uh, I know a couple of them were mentioned by John Mason. Uh, but one, one area uh, that is, is, is in uh, taxis and the Energy Saving Trust uh, currently offers interest-free loans to enable owners and operators of hackney cabs to be replaced but when they are more than eight years old with new and efficient models. However, the scheme does not pay for the conversion of vehicles 
and I'd be grateful for any update on discussions the Cabinet Secretary or, or Minister uh, has had with the Energy Saving Trust, uh, so that perhaps Stuart Stevenson uh, can take a similar electric taxi journey sometime in the near future in the North East. Uh, the FSB have also called uh, for this government to lend the support for a switch to low emission vehicles uh, through a £15 million pound low emission zone support fund. Uh, and this would enable small businesses to invest in cleaner fleets uh, coinciding with a rollout of low emission zones. Now, as Finlay Carson noted, for many in rural parts of Scotland, having access to a vehicle is vital for personal and business purposes. Right now, the infrastructure is just not in place to give our rural constituents the confidence that they can switch to electric vehicles, a point uh, correctly made by Gillian Martin, and I hope that she can switch to, uh, to an all-electric vehicle sooner rather than later. Uh, Edward Mountain also highlighted how the farming industry is heavily reliant on diesel-operated machinery and will require considerable support in order to help achieve low emission targets. So I joined them in calling for reassurances that the phasing out of petrol and diesel vehicles does not adversely affect our rural communities, nor in public transport, as Lewis MacDonald highlighted. Uh, my colleague John Scott mentioned transport and the use of low emissions vehicles will have a very important part to play in keeping greenhouse gas emissions to a minimum, a point Claudia Beamish, uh, uh, Colin Smith and David Johnson all very much emphasise and, and with support from uh, this side. But right now, we are not where, now where we need to be. And this as SNP government has failed to meet targets under the European Ambient Air Quality Directive for nitrogen oxide, even though the deadline for compliance was back in 2010. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, our environment is fragile and we must do what we can to protect it. And some good examples were set out by John Finney. And so, like him, I urge this SNP government to do more than make pledges. The switch to low emission vehicles will require a collaborative effort across the public and private sector. And right now, this government is not leading the way in lowering emissions and further action is needed to incentivise Scotland to make the switch. So, to conclude, I'd just like to say that we all share the same ambition and we would all support deliverable measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Paul Wheelhouse to close to the Government Minister till 4.30, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And as we've heard throughout this uh, largely consensual debate until uh, some aspects of Mr Burnett's uh, speech, but uh, he did have some warmer words for us as well, we've been making significant progress on our ambitious agenda as a country to decarbonise transport uh, at home for domestic users, but also uh, to provide the infrastructure for visitors to this country as well to access uh, that as well. In respect of Jamie Green's concerns, indeed other uh, members across the chamber's concerns around range anxiety, I think it's important to stress, as the Cabinet Secretary said, while setting out that 1,000 uh, public charging points have been established in Scotland uh, to date, uh, that that uh, excludes uh, consideration of the additional 350 workplace charges that we're funding uh, in an additional £5 million we've, uh, we've investing, we're investing, and a further 1,200 domestic charging points to add to the current 461 workplace uh, charging places and 1,928 domestic charging places that were in place at the end of 1718. So apologies if we've not given the full extent of the figures, but there is much more than the 1,000 uh, public charging places that we have already invested in and will continue to do so. But as the Cabinet Secretary has stated, there are now over 10,000 uh, ultra low emission vehicles in public sector fleets, uh, sorry, 1,000 uh, ultra low emission vehicles in public sector fleets in Scotland. And the support available to businesses and individuals looking to make the switch to an electric vehicle or other uh, low emission vehicle has increased dramatically from £8 million to £20 million. And indeed, I would draw members' attention, I can get further detail to two members of it, the, uh, in terms of the uh, funding that we provide through a low carbon transport loan that the Cabinet Secretary referenced, because that can provide up to £35,000 to cover the cost of purchasing, purchasing a new pure electric or plug-in hybrid vehicle uh, and up to £10,000 to cover the cost of purchasing a new electric motorcycle or scooter for those who are uh, interested in that. And indeed, um, the budget for active travel uh, to address points that were raised by Claudia Beamish and uh, Colin Smith 
has doubled from £39.2 million pounds in 2017-18 to £80 million pounds for 2018-19. So we are recognising the important points he raised about investing in sustainable active travel and encouraging people to lead more healthy lifestyles. We've also finalised the eighth round of the Green Bus Fund, as referenced by the Cabinet Secretary, and anticipate supporting over 125 new green buses in that round. And these are just a few of the highlights um, from an increasingly ambitious agenda I also mentioned, uh, I would like to mention an international dimension and members may not be aware that the Scottish Government is playing a leading role under the under two coalitions zero emission vehicle uh, project and I heard directly the uh, support for the work we're doing with the under two coalition when I uh, visited San Francisco for the Global Climate Action Summit uh, which was um, put in place by Governor Jerry Brown. And our energy strategy published just over a year ago included our ambition to decarbonise the whole energy system. Uh, we now have a target for the equivalent of 50% of the energy for Scotland's electricity, heat and transport consumption to come from renewable sources by 2050. And a key component of meeting this target will be the extent to which we can shift our energy for transport from fossil fuels to low carbon or renewable electricity or indeed hydrogen, which many members have mentioned today. As members have said, transport accounts for just uh, for 25% of our energy use, but 37% of our climate emissions. And so clearly we do recognise the importance of tackling that very important statistic. And the shift to electric vehicles also gives us an opportunity to use more of Scotland's abundant renewable energy resources while reducing our fossil fuel consumption. And Orkney is a, a very good example that Mr MacArthur referenced in terms of the work that's being done there to do exactly that. This raises questions though for our electricity networks which will need to meet and manage the higher demand. And we're working closely with Scotland's network operators and with National Grid to share evidence and analysis, including data from our Charge Place Scotland network, to make sure that transition to electric vehicles is carefully managed and that we limit the impacts on the network through use of smart and other, other innovative charging technologies. I will. Uh, Lewis MacDonald. So would, would, would he accept the point that's been made by members in different parts of the chamber that that renewable energy doesn't just directly support the electricity network, but give Scotland the feedstock for hydrogen production with even wider uses. Minister. Indeed, I'm happy to do so. I will come on to that in more detail uh, shortly, but I, I do recognise um, uh, Mr. Mr. MacDonald's interest in this and other members across the chamber. Indeed, because of the capacity constraints, we have been innovating in the production of hydrogen uh, in the uh, big, big kit project in, in uh, Kirkwall and the uh, surf and turf project also in uh, Kirkwall using surplus tidal energy produced in EDA. Uh, and wind, wind energy produced in EDA to uh, produce storage of electricity in the form of hydrogen. So it's very positive work we've been doing. Uh, if I may very briefly... Uh, Liam MacArthur. I thank the, the Minister for taking the intervention. I would point out the Surf and Turf project is based in, in, in EDA rather than necessarily Kirkwall. But could you give an undertaking that in the future contract with Charge Place Scotland that users will have a meaningful input into that so we can learn some of the lessons from what's happened in the current contract? Minister. I can certainly give the member assurance that uh, officials from Transport Scotland have been engaging uh, with uh, Charge Place Scotland in terms of the uh, problems that have arisen in, in Orkney and indeed in, between Orkney and, and the central belt, which he referenced in previous questions. And uh, certainly happy to take that point up with the member in my island's uh, portfolio discussions with him and indeed the Cabinet Secretary and who has been actively engaged in that. Uh, but the Scottish Government wants to transition to a low carbon economy to be a just one as well. And we, we also have um, established the uh, Just Transition Commission led by the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. That will consider employment, economic and social issues together with the development of climate change policies. And we want therefore for the transition for our transport sector that will be one that ensures that well, no one is left behind as our technological and economic landscape uh, develops. And that's a very important aspect. I know a number of members, John Finney, uh, Claudia Beamish and others have referenced this in the debate today. In the time left available to me, I just want to respond to some of the other points that have been referenced by members in the chamber. Um, in terms of the islands aspect and reality, I've, I've touched on that, but I do think the projects in Orkney are, are, are giving us some major lessons about how we can uh, make rural and island communities benefit from the transition. Uh, I would want to highlight, though, that uh, in terms of the points we made, most laterally by Daniel Johnson, but also by Liam MacArthur, in respect of using Norway as a comparator, that Norway has significantly increased the uptake of ULEVs through a combination of tax and VAT on EVs and incentives such as free parking, which have been referenced by members in the chamber today. I recognise that. But Scottish ministers don't have any locus on VAT or indeed uh, import taxes. This is a reserved matter. So we do need to work with UK government to try and get a supportive fiscal environment in place to encourage a higher take up of EVs there. 
In terms of uh, points being made by Ed Mountain, I recognise the issue he raised around uh, rural sectors and I'm obviously happy to discuss any ideas you may have on that. Uh, clearly tax allowances may be something that could be looked at, uh, maybe at a UK level, but we certainly be keen to discuss what measures could be put in place. Uh, and indeed, I would want to highlight to Colin Smith, who was worried about the lack of uh, apparent uh, strategy and his perception around this, that as the Cabinet Secretary referenced the National Transport Strategy and indeed the uh, Network Vision Statement I'll be publishing uh, later this month will give more detail on the necessity for investment in infrastructure to support EVs and indeed uh, to support the rollout of vehicles more widely. Um, if, if the time I have available, uh, just one minute left, I want to highlight the, the work around hydrogen. I think it is an important point to be raised by members here today. We have companies like Hyundai who are investing uh, £5 billion in R&D uh, in, in the area around hydrogen. Currently, obviously, produce uh, models. Honda and Toyota are two other major manufacturers that are known to be interested in rolling out um, uh, hydrogen models. And clearly, this is an indication of significant money in the automotive sector that's being directed towards hydrogen. And I do take the point that's been made, raised by members around heavy goods vehicles and other uh, transport options. And that's why the work in Leavenmouth, in particular, looking at commercial vehicles and refuse collection vehicles, uh, will give us some advice about how those, uh, that technology can work there. But I'll wind up, uh, presiding officer, because I know there's important business to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the debate on ultra-low emission vehicles.